My name is Jeffrey Gamble. I'm a retired lawyer and diplomat and the, currently the governor of the Delaware Mayflower Society. I'm a descendant twice over of Stephen Hopkins and twice from Richard Warren and once from Francis Cook. When I was in college, I developed a great interest in the 17th century uh, because I think it's one of history's inflection points, a time really when the modern era began. I, know, I carved, uh, decided to carve a uh, model of the Mayflower from a log taken in our yard. I'd always wanted to try my hand at carving and this seemed to be a good opportunity to do it. I looked online for model ship parts but soon realized that they were so expensive it would be cheaper just to buy a pre-made model. So I decided to take a different approach. I only made use of items found around the house. Chopsticks, skewers, wooden matches, paint, some dolls left over from our children's school projects long ago. It started out to be a toy for our grandchildren to learn something about the Mayflower, but soon evolved into something more than a toy and I wouldn't let them touch it. It became actually a working model and it floats. My wife Dorcas was endlessly creative with ideas and let me dip freely into her sewing resources for sails, threads, and items for a great many of the details on the ship. Under the bell of this model is a piece of 500 year old white oak uh, taken from the barn of Jordans in Northamptonshire, England. You may remember that this barn is said to have been built from the beams of our Mayflower. There were 26 ships named Mayflower registered in the port books of England between 1603 and 1625. Why the name was so popular, no one knows. So it's difficult to say definitively that the beam and the Jordan's barn are from our ship. But it is certainly possible, if not probable, that what you see under the bell of my, my model is a tiny piece of the famous Mayflower on which the pilgrim sailed. In the hold of the model are pebbles collected from the area just in front of Plymouth Rock. You may recall that Master Jones used rocks from the Plymouth shoreline as ballast for the return trip home. We'll be using this little ship uh, as kind of a means of stirring our imaginations. We don't know a great deal about the exact nature of the Mayflower or its crew or even the passengers, though in hindsight it has become one of the most important ships in history. At the time, and the people it held, were not so very special. Governor Bradford, who began writing about the voyage ten years after it occurred, did not even mention the ship by name. However, just as, we, if, as if we were flying a thousand feet above the ground and can see the earth, we can get a pretty good idea of what the earth is like, even if our feet aren't exactly touching it. We are going to do a little time travel now and go back to a single day in an age gone by, Wednesday, September 6, 1620 old style, and to a place, Plymouth, England, where the merchant ship Mayflower is tied up at a wharf along the quay, ready to make sail on the ebbing tide. Now there's a price to pay for time travel. Those of us who love history have, fa have fantasized about a voyage into the past. Many of us would give a great deal to go back to 1620 for a look. One generation's impossible dream becomes the next generation's breakthrough and winds up a necessity for the generation after that. But brace yourself. If we time travel back through those generations, we become increasingly aware of what is missing. As a man, my wristwatch is gone. It wasn't invented until 1915 during World War I. The fillings in my teeth have disappeared. The first fillings weren't invented until 1819 using mercury. Not a good idea. Your teeth feel good, but you may lose your nose. My eyeglasses have vanished. Although they were invented in 1620, they were not the kind you could put on your nose. They were more like magnifying glasses that you held up when you needed them. No belt. It was not used to hold up trousers until the 1930s. In 1620, no zippers either. Buttons held up my trousers to my doublet. There was no right or left shoe. They weren't invented until 1870. If I were a woman, my bras disappeared. Bras or brassieres were not invented until 1929 in Paris. Where else? 
Luckily, dresses of the time went down to the floor because my underwear has vanished. Underpants were not worn by women, even in America, until the 1820s. Before that time, they were considered unhealthy and even immoral. Remember that one of the nine witchcraft charges the English levied against Joan of Arc only a century and a half earlier was that she wore pants. As late as 1933, movie star Melina Dietrich was arrested in Paris, a Paris railway station, for wearing trousers as she alighted from the train. In 1920, instead of underwear, men and boys wore a long shirt, and women and girls wore what was called a shift, a long dress-like nightie underneath or outer clothes. Oh, and another thing, females would have always worn a cap or bonnet over their hair in public. Only prostitute and pre-teenage girls wore their hair loose and uncovered. And no yellow dresses, they were only worn in England by prostitutes. You often hear that men and women in that era did not bathe and must have therefore been very dirty. That's not true. The linen shirts and shifts they wore absorbed bodily oils and excretions and were then washed regularly. Today, our bodies, which are used to daily showering, produce more oils to counter those lost from frequent bathing. So that if we, all of a sudden, stopped bathing frequently, we would feel yucky. They didn't. The entry in Mort's relation for Monday, November 13, 1620 read, Our people went on shore to refresh themselves and our women to wash, as they had great need. This passage is often cited as the origin of the mythical tradition in New England of Monday as wash day. And one has the image of Mayflower women heading off to shore with a laundry basket under one arm and a scrub brush under the other. However, it is not clear if the women were washing clothing or themselves. It is difficult to imagine them frolicking in an icy creek, throwing the sponge back and forth. So in all likelihood, they were washing their shifts in the children's linen. Other outer clothes uh, were rarely, if ever, washed. Our Mayflower ancestors, however, did bring bed bugs and tuberculosis with them to the New World. One was annoying, the other lethal. The year I was born, 1945, in my home state of Rhode Island, tuberculosis was still the leading cause of death, even after 300 years. One year later, it was only a minor condition because of the antibiotic streptomycin, which had been discovered in 1943. It has been said that happiness is the correlation between objective conditions and subjective expectations. In plain English, this means you cannot be unhappy missing something you don't know exists. Waking up in 1620, after the initial fascination wore off, we would soon be quite miserable, miss missing all the things that make up our life and habits in the present time. It is likely that our ancestors in their world were no more or less happy than we are today. Now that we have adjusted to the attire and expectations of the era, let's explore the ship, which will be the Voyager's home for the better part of the next six months. The Mayflower was based upon the Dutch Fluit or Flute, a dedicated cargo vessel originating in the Dutch Republic in the 16th century. Since it was not designed to be converted into a warship, it was cheaper to build, carried twice the cargo, and could be handled by a smaller crew. In addition, a shallow draft of about 12 feet allowed it to bring cargo in and out of ports and up rivers that other vessels couldn't reach. However, the shallow draft was not particularly suited to transatlantic crossings. Let's start at the top. The flag on the foremast is the Cross of St. George, the national flag of England, allegedly brought back from the Crusades by Richard of the Lionhearted, but certainly in use by 1265 AD at the Battle of Evesham. The flag on the mainmast is the Union Jack, approved by King James I in 1607, combining the Cross of St. George and the Cross of St. Andrew, the national flag of Scotland. This was first used at the Battle of Otterburn in 1388. King James was James I of England, but James VI of Scotland, since the countries were not politically united at the time. On the mizzenmast, in the stern, is the flag of the town of Harwich, or Harwich in American English, or Hawich in New England English. It contained a portcullis, or sea gate, which the town adopted as its seal in 1604, when its charter was renewed. The Mayflower was square-rigged, with two masts, each holding a mainsail and a topsail, and behind them, on the mizzenmast, what is known as a lateen, or slanted sail, 
It was in the, it and the sprit sail on the bow were not designed to propel the ship, but to help the hel helmsman keep on course. The person in charge of the ship's rigging and sails, the anchors, and the ship's longboat was the bosun. The majority of crew members, before the mast as they say, were most likely under his supervision, working the sails and rigging. William Bradford made this comment about the Mayflower bosun. The bosun was a proud young man who would often curse and scoff at the passengers, but when he grew weak, they had compassion on him and helped him. But despite such assistance, the unnamed bosun died the first winter. Below the mizzenmast is the poop deck. From here, the pilot called out the course to the helmsman who was stationed in the steerage room down through the aft hatch grate. The helmsman manned a whip staff, not a wheel. It was on a pinion, and it moved the tiller from right to left on the next deck below. Unlike the tiller we see on a sailboat, which you push in the opposite direction from where the, you want to sail, moving the whip staff puts the ship in the direction of the staff. The downside of a whip staff is that it only turned the ship 10 degrees in either direction. If you wanted to make a bigger turn, you had to pull in your mainsail in the direction of your turn by hand or by means of a capstan, a sprocketed heavy-duty winding mechanism on the deck. Also in the steerage room, just forward of the whip staff, was the binnacle. This is a small wooden cabinet containing the compass, candles to light it, the traverse board, and an hourglass to measure the time. The traverse board, which resembled a circular cribbage board, was used to mark the length of time sailed in a particular compass course and the estimates of speed during each watch. The room is also likely where the ship's officers uh, slept in box-like beds built into the bulkheads. Continuing through the steerage room towards the stern was the so-called great cabin, belonging to the ship's master, Master Jones, would have had this room to himself. It was only about 10 feet by 7 feet in size, but did have outside windows facing aft. In the other direction, the next deck forward was the quarter deck. Here was a barrel of fresh water filled by rain, used sparingly for washing and perhaps drinking. Also here was a brazier and a large cauldron where the Mayflower went on a whaling expedition near Greenland. Uh, it was used uh, to boil down whale blubber for oil. On our voyage, it would have been used to boil the linens and other clothes. We know it was on the Mayflower because a similar cauldron had been jettisoned off the coast of Norway on an earlier voyage to save the ship from foundering. Dividing the quarter deck from the main deck was a railing containing the ship's bell. It was used to mark the times for the various watches and was also traditionally used as a water container for baptisms at sea, such as that of Oceanus Hopkins, whose parents were not separatist. On the main deck was the 15-foot ship's boat or longboat. It was typical of work boats carried aboard ships of the Mayflower's size. Normally the boat was towed behind the ship except in stormy weather. The other boat the Mayflower carried was a shallop, a much larger boat measuring 30 feet long and weighing about four tons. During the voyage it was disassembled and the parts were stowed in the middle of the gun deck along with the passengers and then reassembled by the ship's carpenter on the Provincetown beach when the Mayflower arrived there. As many as 12 passengers slept in parts of the, of the boat during the voyage. Moving forward is the forecastle or forecastle, which is where the ship's cooking was done on a brick stove with a metal smokestack. The ship's cook was responsible for preparing the cruise meals, maintaining all food supplies and managing the galley. The unnamed cook died the first winter. Lastly, beyond the bowsprit or beakhead, you will notice uh, is, is, is the BF's bowsprit. You will notice that it had two doors opening onto it. The crew and passengers in the Mayflower used the bowsprit sitting on lattice when nature called. The bowsprit was conveniently downwind from the rest of the ship. As we face the bow, the left-hand side of the ship in the 17th century was called the larboard, the right side the starboard. 
These, these nautical terms come from the Vikings. On their ships, the starboard or steerboard, board for steering, was on the right because most Viking sailors were right-handed. The side without anything sticking out would have been the one up against the dock or port and was called the larboard from the Viking word later board. Uh, the term later is related to the modern English words load and laden. Larboard sounds similar to starboard, and this presented problems in roaring winds and foul weather. So in 1844, the Royal Navy ordered the word port to be used instead. The United States Navy followed suit in 1846. The decorative reinforcing bands along the side of the Mayflower are called whales. The top one is called the gunwale or gunnel. Hanging over the port gunnel is a plumb bob for sounding to gauge the depth of the water. It was made of lead and has a hollowed out bottom which was filled with grease or wax in order to pick up sand and debris, which indicated how close to land the ship was. Also on this deck is a chum bucket and fishing hooks in, and line to catch fish on the voyage. Fishing was one of the quartermaster's jobs. Fresh fish would have been a welcome change from the usual fare each day. Going below, uh, the cabin under the forecastle is where the crew slept and where a windlass or horizontal capstan was located to raise and lower the anchors. The crew slept in hammocks. Hammocks had been discovered by Christopher Columbus on his first voyage. He recorded that the Carib Indians wove a net made from the bark of the hammock tree and used it, tied it to two other trees for sleeping. It quickly caught on with European sailors in all countries. The Royal Navy officially adopted them in 1597. There were not enough hammocks for the entire crew in the Mayflower. They hot racked it. Those of you who are in the Navy will know what this means. With a third of the crew always on duty, the hammocks were never empty. Proceeding aft and directly below the main or weather deck was the gun deck, open to the air above by a substantial gridded hatch cover. The area was about 50 by 25 feet and only five and five and a half feet high. It was here that most of the passengers rode out the voyage. People were a very unusual cargo and accommodations had to be made. The ship's carpenter no doubt created six or seven stalls or partitions of about four or five feet wide on each side. Using the bulkhead or outer wall of the ship, he likely placed wooden boards and slotted posts on two sides and finally a curtain on the front side facing inward. They were called cabins at the time, but they were no more than alcoves. Our ancestors did not have a modern sense of privacy. This did not come along until the early 19th century. Today, decency and privacy are linked. In the 17th century, they were not. Indeed, there is no mention of the right of privacy in our Bill of Rights. This constitutional right was created under what was known as the Penumbra Theory by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1956 in order to decriminalize birth control methods. In the middle of the deck, in the midst of st the stalls and behind the disassembled shallock, or in between it, the ship's carpenter would have constructed a rectangular door frame bounded by a floor frame, sorry, founded on all sides by thick wooden boards. Within the space directly under the main hatch, he would have put a layer of bricks and then a layer of sand. This was the cooking area for the passengers. They could hang their individual cooking pots on chains from the grid of the hatch and cover them and, and cover above them. They likely had a small cold breakfast of porridge and only one hot meal in mid-afternoon, which they cooked individually with the food and firewood allotted to them each day. At night, they would have hung what are called land horns from, each grid, from the hatch grid for light. They were made from translucent animal corns, horns and were the ancestors of modern day lanterns. Some passenger families brought their bedsteads with them. Husbands and wives, female children and baby boys slept with their families in their family stalls. Servants, young men and boys slept wherever they could. There's no grand staircase on the Mayflower. From the gun deck, they had to use a rope or wooden ladder to get up to the main deck. Women and children might have used chamber pots attached to the hull when nature called and not gone up to the bowsprit. In the 17th century, the word for chamber pots was thunder mugs. What we might find offensive to a point, they did not. The noses of our 17th century ancestors were used to bad smells, just as our ears today are used to endless noise pollution. 
the 17th century English man and woman had a sense of humor. Chamber pots often had a picture of a bee in the porcelain bottom of the bowl. The word for bee in Latin is apis, apis, which of course has an entirely different meaning in English. After the gun deck, uh, where the passengers travel, was the gun room, off limits to them. It held powder and ammunition and probably most of the cannon, which had to be relocated to make room for the passengers. This was the domain of the master gunner, who was in charge of the ship's cannon, firearms, ammunition, and powder. He is recorded in go as going on the Cape Cod exploration on December 6, 1620, and was, quote, sick unto death, and so remained all that night and the next day, unquote. He died later that winter. The Mayflower carried 10 cannon, four on each side, and two stern chasers used to fire out the back at a ship, anyone who might be pursuing them. Among the cannons, the ship may have had two br cast in brass, one or two of them, which were lighter and stronger than those made of iron. The Mayflower was fairly heavily armed. Her largest gun was a minion weighing 1,200 pounds. It could shoot a 3.5 pound cannonball almost a mile. She also had a Saker cannon of about 800 pounds and two base cannons weighing 200 pounds apiece. Master Jones unloaded four of these pieces to help fortify the Plymouth colony. Beneath the gun deck was the cargo hold, where the passengers stored the majority of their provisions and supplies. The stores were carefully separated into three categories. One, food and drink for the crew, two, food and drink for the passengers, and three, food for the new settlement until the first planting and harvest had taken place. The maintenance of these cargo barrels was Cooper John Alden's responsibility. Barrels or cast in those days came in various sizes, the largest being the burgundy ton, from which we derive our modern unit of weight, the ton. Smaller barrels on the Mayflower were hogshead, firkins, kegs, kilderkins, tierces, runlets, and puncheons. Children, children, pilgrim children would have known all of these names. The quartermaster uh, also had down there chests consisting of military supplies, work supplies, and for cooking there were various implements. No forks though. They were not commonly used in England or America until the 1830s. They were considered before that to be an effeminate affectation. Think of John Wayne uh, smoking his camels with a cigarette holder. That was the way forks were regarded in those days. The quartermasters were also responsible for the crew's hours for standing watch. The names of the quartermasters uh, are unknown, but it is recorded that three of the four men died at Plymouth in the first wimmer. Winter, sorry. Now that we have toured the ship, let's have a look at the crew. First, though, we have to brace ourselves for their language. Cursing and swearing in the 17th century was very different than it is today. Our passengers and crew were very familiar with the F word and the C word, and their use, although coarse, would not have shocked them very much. Even country doctors and midwives would have used the C word for their professional conversations. It did not become totally obscene until the latter part of the 17th century when it became fashionable for the medical profession to use Latin words for body parts. So womb became uterus, skull became cranium, and so forth. The N-word was commonly used and not thought of as offensive. Throughout the Middle Ages in England, the word for Africans, especially North Africans, was Blackamoor, from which we get such surnames as Blakemore, Morris, Blake, and Moorhead. People either descended from immigrant Africans or having dark complexions. About 1500, the Portuguese maps began to show up in England, designating the land south of the Sahara as Terra dos Negros, land of the blacks. The N-word is derived from this and did not become inappropriate until the early 20th century. What would have deeply offended our pilgrim ancestors are phrases we hear every day now on television, such as, I swear to God, God damn it, or for God's sake. So-called papist oaths were forbidden by law, such as by the mass, by our lady, which might have been corrupted into bloody, and by the saints, or by God's blood, which smacked too much of the doctrine of transubstantiation. Taking the name of God himself in vain was considered offensive in the extreme, even though sailors regularly did it. For example, in the 19th century, a sailor might say, 
if I'm not telling you the truth, may God blind me, which became God blind me, and then simply blind me, which we associate today with English sea dogs in the movies. Next, we have to make ourselves aware of sailor superstitions. No bananas on board. Our crew knew well that ever since Spain began transporting products from the Caribbean a hundred years before, most cases of disappearing ships had for some reason involved cargoes of bananas. It was said that rotten bananas produced deadly toxic fumes in the cargo hold. Another theory was that tarantulas or some species of deadly spiders lurked in the banana bunches. Women were said to bring bad luck because they distracted sailors from their sea duties. Obviously, the Mayflower cargo of male and female passengers, 18 couples, 32 children, 11 young women, as well as a dozen young men, meant that this superstition had to be suspended uh, for the voyage, but suspicions lingered. Oddly enough, the semi-nude female figurehead on the bow was completely welcome. It had nothing to do with sex or naughtiness. This superstition springs, springs from the old Norse god of the sea whose name was Agar, kind of their version of Neptune. Agar was married to Ran, and they had nine daughters who looked pretty much like mermaids. That is why ships, even a century later, typically carried a carving of a topless woman on the bow as a figurehead. It fooled the sea god Agar into thinking that it was one of his daughters coming for a visit, and the seas remained calm. All religions became superstitions, and it would be difficult to find in the world a more superstitious lot than sailors. A voyage was considered ill-fated if it began on the following days, Fridays, unlucky because Jesus was crucified on a Friday, Thursdays because that was Thor's day, the god of thunder and storms, the first Monday in April because that's the day that Cain slew Abel, the second Monday in August because it is the day that the kingdom of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. You will note that the Mayflower sailed on a Wednesday. Now that we have steeled ourselves for their salty talk and their superstitions, let's go ahead and meet the crew of the Mayflower. Officers and, uh, the officers and crew uh, were in toto consisted of a master, four mates, two of whom were pilots, four quartermasters, a surgeon, a carpenter, a cooper, a cook, a bosun, a master gunner, and at least 13 men before the mask, making for a total of about 30. The entire crew stayed with the Mayflower in Plymouth through the winter of 1620-21. Half of them perished during that time and were buried on Coles Hill along, in, along with the pilgrims who had died as well. A lucky ship's master began voyages with twice the minimum crew he needed to sail his ship. In the case of our voyage, this precaution sadly proved to be necessary because the deaths uh, in Plymouth over the winter, because of that, the remaining crew returned to England on the Mayflower, which sailed for London on April 5, 1621. This date has no meaning for us today, but it meant a great deal to the crew of the Mayflower and the pilgrims themselves. April 5, 1621 was March 26, 1621 on the old style Julian calendar. And that was the day after New Year's, a time for new beginnings. Now you may ask, why March 25th? Why was that designated New Year's Day in the Julian calendar? It's because March 25th is the Feast of the Annunciation, also called Lady Day in England, when the Archangel Gabriel informed the Virgin Mary that she was with child. It was thought that the New Year should begin on the day of Christ's conception. We know the names of a handful of crewmen, Williamson, Ely, Coppin, English, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on only two of them about whom we know the most. The ship's master, Christopher Jones, and the chief pilot and master's mate, John Clark. In the 17th century, only captains of the Royal Navy ships were called by that name. Commanders of merchant ships were called master. So Jones was never Captain Jones, he was only Master Jones. From little hints in the commentaries and records of the time, Jones appears to have been a genuinely kind and decent man, different from the portrayals of him by Spencer Tracy and Anthony Hopkins in the movies. Jones was born about 1570 in Harwich, which is in the county of Essex on the coast of the North Sea. When he was eight, his father Christopher Jones Sr. died, leaving him part ownership of a ship called the Marie Fortune upon his 18th birthday. 
During Christmas time of 1593, he married literally the girl next door, or in this case, the girl across the street. Her name was Sarah Twitt. Her father was a wealthy merchant. When her father died in 1599, Christopher and Sarah were left a share of the ship Apollo. Sarah died in 1603, and six months later, Christopher married a young widow, Josian Gray, the daughter of a man named Thomas Thompson. Both Josian's dead husband and her father were ship owners and merchants in Harwich. By 1604, through inheritance and hard work, the Jones had amassed a decent-sized estate, and Christopher was one of the 32 Burgesses named in the city's renewed charter in that year. The following year, Jones headed a consortium and had a ship of his own built at 240 tons, which he named the Josian after his wife. His first voyage in 1607 was to Bordeaux, France, ended up in the High Admiralty Court when a person, the person who retained him to transport 15 tons of Damascan prunes, prunes from Bordeaux to London failed to pay. The case dragged on for some time. About 1608, Christopher Jones appeared to have traded away the Josian to one Robert Bonner for the smaller and older 180-ton ship called the Mayflower. It is not known why he did this or just when the Mayflower was constructed. <clears throat> Possibly his quarter share in the Mayflower was more than his share of the jo Josian. Given the 20 to 25 year lifespan of wooden ships in the era, it is likely that the Mayflower was constructed at Harwich at about uh, 1600. Interestingly, there are two ships named Mayflower that fought against the Spanish Armada invasion in 1588. Some have claimed that our Mayflower might have been one of them. This is certainly possible, but not likely because of the limited longevity of 17th century wooden ships. Jones' first voyage on the Mayflower turned out to be as memorable as that of the Josian. One Andrew Pauling, a London merchant, hired the Mayflower in August 1609 under a standard shipping contract known as a charter party to carry a cargo of hemp, hats, salt, vinegar, hops, and wine to Trondheim, Norway. The Mayflower was to sail to Trondheim and remain there for 21 days for the cargo to be unloaded and sold and a return cargo to be purchased and brought back. What Jones did not know was that Pauling was on the verge of bankruptcy and was counting on the sale of the Mayflower's return cargo by November 1609 to stave off his principal creditor, one Bevel Molesworth. Don't you just love British names? November came and went, but the Mayflower was nowhere to be seen. What happened? First, it took more than two months to sell off the cargo in Norway, far beyond the anticipated 21 days. Secondly, when the Mayflower did finally begin its return trip, it was caught up in one of those notorious North Sea storms, blown 300 miles off course and almost lost at sea. During the tempest, Master Jones had to jettison his iron cauldron, his hawser, a cable, an anchor, and the cargo of over a hundred deal boards, pine or fir planks, just to keep the ship afloat. Finally, on December 6, the battered Mayflower limped into the Thames and anchored off Ratcliffe Mill across the river from Rotherhide. As if things weren't bad enough, it was then discovered that Pauling's agent in Trondheim, his incompetent brother-in-law, had only filled uh, part of the uh, other part of the cargo, barrels of herring and tar half full. While the Mayflower had been gone, Pauling had offered the whole cargo of the unarrived ship to pay off Molesworth. Molesworth, being no fool, would not accept payment of a debt in what were then non-existent goods. At the end of November, the exasperated Molesworth had Pauling clapped into debtor's prison. At this point, Molesworth himself, excuse me, went bankrupt, owing the crown nearly 200 pounds. To stay out of jail, he turned all of his debt, bonds, and accounts receivable over to the king for collection. Not aware of Molesworth's debt having been assumed by the crown, a brooding Pauling paced his cell, hatched a plot to deprive Molesworth of any money. On the evening of December 6, when word reached him that the Mayflower 
had at long last arrived home, Pauling sold all his rights to the cargo to one Richard Nottingham for 150 pounds. Nottingham arrived at the Mayflower at 7 a.m. the next morning, December 7th, paid the freight charge of 125 pounds and took custody of his cargo. Molesworth, meanwhile, got wind of the Mayflower's arrival and four hours later at 11 a.m. that day informed a Crown officer who then boarded the Mayflower to detain the goods for the payment of his debt. Unfortunately, Molesworth, the goods would no longer belong to Pauling but to Nottingham. Attorneys for the Crown promptly marched into Admiralty Court and claimed that the transfer of ownership from Pauling to Nottingham was fraudulent. For five long weeks the ownership was disputed in court and an unhappy Kit Jones had to sit on his ship with the as yet unloaded cargo waiting for a resolution. It came when the Admiralty Court found against the Crown and declared that Pauling's bill of sale to Nottingham was valid and the cargo belonged to Nottingham. Christopher Jones then sued Paulings for 160 pounds in demurrage, delaying fees. The outcome of this case is not recorded, uh, indicating that it might have been settled out of court. Jones resolved never again to carry the cargo of just one merchant and never again to sail in the North Sea. After the Pauling Nottingham cargo was finally unloaded, the Mayflower was used almost exclusively in the French wine trade from 1510 to 1520. A typical outboard cargo consisted of cloth, pewter, iron, and tobacco with a return freight of French wines, vinegar, and basalt. The only other extraordinary voyage the Mayflower made was in August of 1615 to Malaga in Spain. Time in the Port of London was not without incident. In 1616, a young sailor by the name of Edward Bailey accidentally fell overboard and drowned. Few people, even sailors, could swim in those days. An officer of the Crown, one John Calkin, was dispatched to investigate the death. Regrettably, he could not resist the temptation to help himself to some of the ship's wine cargo a little too liberally. He got drunk and tried to start a mutiny amongst the Mayflower crew. Master Jones was yet again back in Admiralty Court, suing him for 100 pounds. Four years later, in May of 1620, as the Mayflower was unloading her cargo, a London merchant by the name of John Crabb purchased several tons and a hogshead of the ship's wine. About this time, Thomas Weston and Robert Cushman were trying to locate a ship to take the pilgrims to northern Virginia. Cushman apparently knew Crabb, and this was probably the way that he and Weston came to know of the Mayflower's availability. In any event, by June of 1620, Jones and the Mayflower had been hired for the Pilgrim Voyage. Master Jones, after the trip, never fully recovered from his only voyage to the New World and died most likely of tuberculosis in 1622. Untreated, tuberculosis usually takes two years to kill. He and his second wife, Josian, had a total of nine children, the last, John Jones, being born in March 1621 in Harwich when his father was in America. The names of his children disappear from the parish registries around, in and around Harwich, indicating that some of them likely emigrated to America. Indeed, uh, the youngest, John, died in Virginia in 1657. He had many descendants. One of his five times great grandsons, Captain Augustus Clayton Jones, was killed fighting for the Confederacy at the Second Battle of Bull Run in February of 1863. Let me now turn to the other crew member we shall discuss, perhaps the most interesting person of them all, master's mate John Clark. By the age of 45 in 1620, Clark had already had greater adventures than most other mariners in that most dangerous era. His piloting career had begun in England in about 1609 when he sailed to Spain. Early in 1611, he was the pilot of a 300-ton ship on his way to the New World in his first voyage, with a convoy sailing from London to the new settlement of Jamestown in Virginia. Two other ships were in that convoy, and the three of them brought 300 new male settlers to Jamestown. 
So not only did John Clark have experience as a pilot on a ship successfully making it to the New World, but he had experience with a ship full of human passengers. While in Jamestown, Clark piloted his ship into the mouth of the James River to Point Comfort, the farthest point upriver that large ships could sail. For many weeks thereafter, he supervised the barging upriver of the colony, to the colony of 600 barrels of flour, 50 barrels of gunpowder, and other supplies that the ship had brought over, and loading the ship back up with timber and sassafras for the return voyage to England. During one of these trips, he noticed a Spanish vessel enter the mouth of the James River. The ship's master, Don Diego de Molina, sent some of his men to inform the English that he was seeking another Spanish ship that had gotten lost along the coast. The English commander of the Point Comfort outpost told Molina that his ship was not anchored in a safe place and that he should move closer to the small English fort on the shore. Molina said that he did not have a pilot capable of doing that. Thereupon the commander ordered Clark to take a longboat out to the Spanish ship and guide it into a safe harbor. Leery of a trap, Don Diego refused to move his ship and also demanded that his own men on shore be returned. When the English dissembled and said that they would first have to consult the Jamestown governor several hours upriver, Molina sailed away, taking with him John Clark, now a captive. He was taken as a prisoner to Havana, where he remained for two years and then transported to Malaga on the coast of southern Spain, east of Gibraltar. In 1616, he was finally freed in a prisoner exchange by England. By 1618, he was back in Jamestown as a pilot on the ship Falcon. Shortly after his return to England from this voyage, he was hired as a pilot for the Mayflower in 1620. He was the only Roman Catholic on the Mayflower. Now, you may be thinking that's impossible. I didn't even, I didn't learn that in school, but it's true. Clark's depositions now in the general archive in Simancas, Spain, and the archives of the Indies in Seville indicate that he converted probably to achieve better confinement conditions, but also because he was under the care of the Spanish Franciscan friars who were genuinely good people, regularly buying Indian slaves in the market uh, to give them their freedom and allowing prisoners to live in their convent on parole. In any event, Clark publicly recanted when he got back to England because as a Roman Catholic, he would, not, he would have had to have pay a huge annual fine, not to mention being suspected of being a Spanish spy. He would also have been deprived of all civil rights, including holding a pilot's license. This did not stop him, however, but continue to be, to be what is known as a crypto or secret Catholic or pop, possibly an Anglo-Catholic. It's hard to say. Clark wasn't a, alone. Uh, there is a persistent story that Miles Standish was a Roman Catholic. He, this is based upon his insistence that he was related to the ancient family of Standish of Standish, which remained uh, steadfastly Catholic after the Reformation and the fact that he originated in a heavily Catholic region of Lancashire. Williston in his books notes on page 141 that alone amongst the pilgrim leaders, he never joined the church at Plymouth. I don't believe uh, this is the case. The following entry in the Plymouth Colony records indicates that Miles Standish attended the Plymouth church with his family and may have been a member at the time of the record it, that, when it was made. Anno 1632, April 2nd, the names of those which promised to remove their families to live in the town in the winter time that they may better repair to the worship of God. John Alden, Captain Standish, Jonathan Brewster, Thomas Prince. Unlike Standish, there is no question of Squano's religious denomination. He learned Spanish in addition to English. He received religious instruction and was baptized as a Catholic and actively practiced his faith in Malaga. When he expressed a desire to return to his homeland, the friars paid for his overland journey to the Netherlands en route to England and home. Uh, back home in America, he politely resisted all attempts by the pilgrim to join their church. 
What is truly amazing is that in 1615, Clark was on parole under the supervision of the Franciscan friars in Malacca at the same time that Tusquanum or Squano was under their care as well, having been bought by the friars from slavery into which his kidnapper, Thomas Hunt, had sold him. Add to this the interesting fact that the Mayflower under Master Jones was also in Malaga the very same time, August 1615, as makes it fascinating whether they knew each other. Malaga is not a large city, it's hemmed in by mountains, and it's quite probable that they did meet and were only to be reunited again on the other side of the world five years later. Back in England, Clark's parish church, St. Mary the Virgin in Rotherhide, continues to this day as an Anglo-Catholic uh, congregation which refuses, for example, to recognize the validity of women uh, priests and has to be administered canonically under a separate basis, on a separate basis by the Church of England. After the Mayflower voyage, Clark returned yet again to Jamestown, intending to settle there. In any event, it was an unfortunate choice. In 1622, he was murdered in the Indian massacre led by Chief Powhatan. Clark's seamanship had saved the pilgrims in their shallop, and Clark's Island off Plymouth is named for him. While much of John Clark's biographical history is known, his genealogical background is more obscure. He is almost certainly uh, to have been the John Clark who was baptized at Rotherhide in 1575, and quite possibly the father of Thomas Clark, an early Plymouth settler who was baptized in 1600 in St. Dunstan's Stepney, Middlesex, directly across the River Thames from Rotherhide. This Thomas Clark is often conf confused with John and is listed on his tombstone on Burial Hill as having himself been on the Mayflower as a mate. However, the tombstone uh, is a bronze plaque that was not installed till 1891. Thomas Clark was much too young to have been a seasoned pilot and caught up in all the early adventures of John Clark. A possible grandson of John's was William Clark, son of Thomas, whose house was located under what is now the lowing, lower parking lot of Plymouth Patuxent. During King Philip's War on, Sunday, on a Sunday in 1676, while William Clark was at church, his home was attacked by Indians and 11 people were killed. The only survivor of this massacre was his eight-year-old son, another Thomas Clark, who received several severe blows from a tomahawk and was left to die. A cap covering the holes in his skull was fashioned out of some melted down silver spoons, and he lived for a number of years as under the name of a silver-headed Tom. Silver, you know, is a bactericide. Another possible grandson was Nathaniel Clark, who died in 1717, who was a Plymouth's first lawyer. Let me conclude with a word or two about the voyage itself. In the 17th century, wind-driven voyages were all about rhythm and sounds. On the water, the Mayflower became almost a living thing, the crew shouting, maybe even singing, as they carried out their orders. The creak and groan of the ship's wooden hull held together with tr trunnels, tree nails. The rattle of the running rigging. The luff and snap of the sails as they caught the wind. The chop of the waves. The roll of the ship on the sea. At night, the ski sea sky was pitch black with millions of stars to be seen something we have never experienced with present-day urban light pollution illuminating the skies over most of the world. This all sounds swashbuckling and romantic, but what about our passengers below on the gun deck? Without a doubt, it was miserable. In addition to everything we have described, add on the weather decks, to the weather decks a multiple of cleats, kevels, buckets, pins for belaying, the rigging and coils of rope, all to stumble over. Observe the 102 assorted pilgrims and columnists, the 25 to 30 crew members, clutter the tween deck space with a disassembled shallot, add cold autumn weather, chilly water dripping on everyone through, a leak, through the leaky top decks, tossed liberally over the ocean for two months, often beating against the wind and top it all off with squawking children and the inevitable difficult relations between human beings in close quarters. Aside from a few paragraphs in William Bradford's account, 
we do not have much in the way of commentary on the conditions during the actual voyage itself. However, there are a few contempor contemporaneous accounts which give us a good idea of what it was like. There was nausea. Francis Higginson wrote of his voyage in May 1629, we left our dear native soil of England behind us and launched the same day a great way into the main ocean. And now my wife and other passengers begin to feel the tossing of the waves in the Western Sea and so were very seasick. There were children playing. John Winthrop wrote in April 1630, the sickness of our minister and people put us all out of order this day. Our children and others that were sick and lay groaning in their cabins we fetched out. And having stretched a rope from steerage to mainmast, we made them stand, some on one side, some on the other, and sway it up and down till they were warm. And by this means, they grew well and merry. There was fishing. John Jocelyn reported in May of 1638, in the afternoon, the mariner struck, struck a porpoise with a harping iron and hoisted her aboard. They cut some of it into thin pieces and fried. It tastes like rusty bacon. Rusty was the pilgrim's word for rancid. But the liver boiled and sauced sometime in vinegar was more grateful to the palate. Mm. But perhaps the most realistic and telling account is the commentary of a French priest who went on a voyage to Quebec uh, with male and female settlers around the time of the Mayflower voyage or soon thereafter. He says, in the morning when the passengers get up and their stomachs ask for grace, they climb out of the hold and head for the prow where on either side of, of the spit privies have been provided. Sometimes as many as 13 passengers or more will line up for a turn at the seat. When someone takes too long, it is not embarrassment but irritation that is expressed. But the difficulties become really serious in bad weather when the privies are constantly inundated by waves. To go to the seat in the middle of a th storm is thus to risk being completely soaked. Now, I'll pause here and say, or worse, Remember what happened to John Howland on the Mayflower when he went out in a storm to use the privy and fell overboard. So many passengers, I'm back, back to the priest, so many passengers remove their clothing and go stock naked. But in this, the mo modesty suffers greatly, which only stirs the shameful parts even more. Another upside. This, of course, was a French ship, and I like to think our English women ancestors were more modest. The priest concludes by giving very good advice. The passengers must be careful not to hold back on account of false modesty and not relieve their stomachs. To do so is most harmful. At sea, it is easy to become constipated. An old sailor gave me this advice. Go to the privies three or four times every day, even if there is no natural urge. Do not lose hope. Loosen your shirt, shift. Untie all your knots in your clothes over your chest and stomachs, and evacuation will occur even if your bowels are filled with stone. When at last the Mayflower came to anchor off the tip of Cape Cod, Governor Bradford described the little band. He said, but here I cannot stay and take pause and stand half amazed at this poor people's present condition. Being thus past the vast ocean, they now no friends, they have now no friends to welcome them, nor inns to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies. No houses, much less towns, to repair to, to seek for succor. It has been said that the pilgrims were reborn in coming to the new world. In doing so, they became the progenitors of a new aristocracy of merit, an ocean away from a continent full of corrosive and nobiliary privileges and, and entitlement. As with every 17th century birth, there is involved pain and sometimes even death. If this is so, then the Mayflower itself and her crew were in a very real sense the midwives of this renaissance. Willingly or not, the Mayflower by 1624, its hulk and ribs rotting in the midst of the red drift flats beside Rotherhide, served its purpose. The crew and pilgrims, many of whose bones lie on coals and burial hill, serve their purpose as well, and in ways they could never have imagined. 
In our time travel, we have examined the earthly evidence of the pilgrim's journey. Far more important is their spiritual legacy, which is timeless. Their voyage changed the world. Their Mayflower Compact laid the foundations of our American democracy, and their faith exalted them beyond the earthly shackles of time and the sadness and misery that life often holds. I like to think that Monday, April 5th, 1621 is the day these English colonists became Americans. As they gazed out over Cape Cod, watching the distant sails of the Mayflower departing for England that was once their home, not a single one gave up and chose to accept Master Jones' kindly officer to return of a return passage. The departure of, of the Mayflower, even so, many of these passengers, crew and, 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 pa and crew, thought they had failed in their purpose, but they didn't. We see God's plans more easily in hindsight than we do in the present. The great theologian and author C.S. Lewis once heard a man say, well, we all have souls. Lewis corrected him, no, each of us is a soul. We have a body. In the rumbling thunder of our own souls, let us hope that some of the Mayflower's lightning flashes in us still. Thank you.